Thanks a lot uh, again. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me and for uh, um, the exciting second day. Let me ask before starting, who was here yesterday? Okay, who is a researcher? Okay, I assume then you know about open access. I will skip uh, two or three slides. Uh, okay. Um, Okay. Uh, so uh, my intention here, thinking that I will be speaking to librarians, is to focus mostly on institutional policies and some things that I think are good to know, for you to know, and some resources. Uh, since the discussion here is about developing a national open access policy in Cyprus, and your funder is thinking about an open access policy, and the institutions are thinking an op about an open access policy, so I will go into some more details about an institutional open access policy in specific that may be of interest for librarians. Sylvia, when I have five minutes, <laughs> let me know so that I'm not late. Okay. Uh, so what is a university open access policy? This is... Um, an official university document. It has to do with the processes of each university. It could be the rector's uh, uh, paper or a, uh, something that the Senate votes or something like that, uh, which requires researchers to deposit and make available in open access their research publications. And we mean primarily the peer-reviewed one, uh, ones. Um, and we want the peer review ones because this is the good, let's say, research which has been accredited by the research community as high quality research. This is why this is our primary interest. Um, it can also say things about open access to research data, especially research data that supports publications. In other words, research data that validates the claims made in publications. Uh, usually, a policy for open access to research data is something separate for institutions. Uh, it's not very common yet. Institutions are now only starting to develop open access policies for open access to research data, which, however, usually belong to a wider context, to a wider policy, which is called policy for research data management. So, for example, it's the policy for research data management of the University of Edinburgh, the University of Oxford. Uh, the British universities all have such uh, policies. Uh, nonetheless, because there is a lot of discussion recently about uh, open access to data underpinning a research publication, an institutional policy may also make recommendations to research to also deposit their research data. Uh, what does this policy usually say? This policy requires the researchers of institutions to deposit their publications in the institutional open access repository. So we are not talking about here about publishing open access, we are talking about a policy that says, for example, the University of Cyprus requires that all uh, peer-reviewed research by faculty be deposited in the institutional repository, Likithos, and be made available in XX time after publication or immediately after publication. We will see this immediately afterwards. So this is a university open access policy. I should uh, no, uh, tell you that this is a different thing from the repository policy. And I'm making a special point here because a lot of times librarians uh, tend to um, merge the two things. These are two different things. So the university open access policy is the general blanket document that requires the researchers to deposit and make open access through the repository. Whereas the repository policy is the regulation of the repository which regulates what goes up on the repository, how it is managed, how it is uh, disseminated, uh, uh, um, retention schedules, how you can pull it up or down from the repository, things like that. So the repository policy is something else. It comes after uh, the open access policy, or anyway, it comes with the repository, let's say, and regulates the function of the repository. This is a higher level policy that we're talking here about. Um, so what does this thing look like? I think it might be very interesting for you to, to get the initial scoop. This, this policy has various elements. What does it regulate? Uh, so it regulates what kinds of research outputs will be deposited in the repository. So a decision needs to be made about this. Uh, it uh, discusses what version will be deposited. Will it be um, for a publication? Will it be the author's final version? Will it be the final PDF as published by uh, the publisher? 
one needs to make a decision about this. Where to deposit, the institutional repository. When to deposit, and there's a big discussion about this, and to make the long story short, a good policy should say that you should deposit at publication. Why? Because the researchers will not bother at any other time. Once the publication is done, they're done with it. So uh, once it is done, uh, if you say, please deposit, you know, after the publication, blah, blah, uh, they most likely will not do it. So uh, um, it, uh, it regulates deposit exemptions. There may be some legitimate reasons why the researchers may not uh, you know, uh, m rather be allowed not to deposit if they have not, yeah, not uh, uh, um, deals with, uh, with uh, publishers. This should not uh, be allowed, but rather some other uh, copyright issues that are relevant that prevent them from, from doing that, and they should be allowed to do that. And then there's this other thing, which again is often confused. It's the date when the, the material should be made open access. So we have two different things here. We have a, a requirement to deposit, and this should always exist, and then the requirement to make open access. These two things can be different. I mean, you require to deposit, but it may be made open access a bit later. You may allow this. So this is something different that one needs to pay attention to. So you need to think how much time after um, things are deposited, publications are deposited, do I allow for making open access? Um, and here, uh, this actually has to do with the embargo length. If the uh, researchers have um, signed, actually, contracts with uh, publishers that do not allow them to make immediately openly accessible, obviously, uh, this uh, brings a problem to UN institutions. Usually have a soft touch on this, so which, is, uh, which we might say is, is preferable. So you want to have the materials in the repository, you want to expose the metadata, and allow a little bit of time to your researchers to make openly available if they're unable to make it immediately available or within one year. And we all know that big publishers such as Elsevier, for example, or Springer, especially Elsevier, tend to extend the embargo length. So libraries tend to, and policies to, to be friendly to researchers with that because you, then you pre create the problems for them in publishing. So the, the main point for you is to get the things into the repository, and you could allow them a bit of time. If there is a strict funder requirement, so for example, imagine that your institutional policy says you must deposit by publication, at publication, and make expose, expose the, 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 the metadata, and we, are, we allow you to make open access after your embargo has expired. If this research on top of you, the institution, has a horizon um, project, the horizon regulations say, say that he cannot uh, not make open access uh, after 12 months. So the, the, the most they have is 12 months. So immediately you see that even though you say, you know, Elsevier may say two, two years, whatever, this researcher will, will need to comply. So actually, actually, you will see that this will become open access within 12 months or that you're being more relaxed and that these researchers must, must comply. So your role also as a library is to help the researcher comply with the funder requirement and it's also the institution's um, responsibility to help the researcher comply with the funder, right? So this particular researcher, although you allow them to honor their embargo, if that were very long, he still needs have, has a higher obligation to the funder to make it available in open access, so they will. So um, the other thing that the policy uh, regulates are licensing conditions. So some institutional policies say, you know, we as a university decide that uh, all the materials that we give we, in, in open access will be licensed with Creative Commons licensing. Either way, the materials on the repository and the policy should, um, should say something about licensing and preferably it should say that we um, encourage licensing. Therefore, the repository regulation then should say that all my materials are licensed in, let's say, CC licenses, blah, blah, blah. So this is a matter that needs to be addressed in an institutional policy. Um, also, again here, you may have funder requirements. For example, Horizon 2020, again, says that they prefer 
Creative Commons licenses, and when uh, they give money for APCs for open access publications, they must be licensed in, in uh, Creative Commons. The, the conclusion from that is that, you know, yes, the institutional policy should address this, and yes, the repository policy should actually accommodate practically Creative Commons licenses, so you should be able as a repository to, uh, to license the material, and this is the most practical thing in Creative Commons. Uh, so, a, an institutional policy may actually also regulate, and this is not very common, this is in the UK, but I'm mentioning it here, the UK's uni universities, the research councils actually required open access publishing, so their policies are a bit different, but here you would, you would not really have this. Um, or where to publish, and actually I will delete this, this is a mistake. An, a, a, an institutional policy may also say something about institutional decision regarding facilitating open access publishing. So, to recapitulate, although an institutional policy will mostly deal with open access through the repository, I think this is clear, right? So it will say, we provide open access through our institutional repository and researchers must deposit a publication and make available in open access at X time. This is what it says. It may also say that the university takes measures to um, support open access publishing if the researchers want to publish. So this is an extra level of support. For example, as the PAC has the um, funding um, APC uh, fund for researchers, the university may decide that, they, that as an additional measure, they, they have some funds to support open access publishing. Now, this is rather unusual, I would say, for Southern Europe, because there is not enough money. So the preferable open access means, and the cheaper, is through the repositories. And you may um, sort of rely to other colleagues from countries with more money and more projects to pay for the APC. So if you have a collaborative project, if it's an FP7, an EU project, Horizon project, they will have money for FPCs. I understand if it's an IP project, they will, the APCs will also be eligible. So if these people have external funding, then they will have APC resources. If they don't have external funding, however, and they want to publish in competitive journals, then perhaps the university might also seek some uh, additional help for, for APCs. So a policy may refer to this or it may not refer to this. And as well as on conditions for using um, publication funds. So. Does, does this make sense, what, what things the policy covers? Okay. Very quickly, what the benefits are of open access policy and open access, I mean, it aligns with university mission to, to widely disseminate outputs. It helps showcase the research of university, helps manage university research and preserve university research. You know that all repositories, I mean, are, are a good first step towards long-term digital preservation. This is not... All that there is there, but it's, you know, it's a good way to start with. They provide also permanent identifiers for all documents. This is quite, quite important. And further, it helps because you align your institution with the European Commission and other funder requirements. And this is very important because uh, effectively you're providing an instrument for your researchers to uh, actually be affecting in collaborating uh, on the basis of the most recent research trends across the world. So... Policies, as I said yesterday, again, you see that institutions are, um, uh, are increasingly developing open access policies. Um, most of the research intensive institutions in the States and in Europe have open access policies. And, uh, you know, everybody really is following because uh, it is clear now that open access is the way to go. And it's institutions that lead the way, not the funders. We should also say this. What do you need to prepare for an open access policy? What do you need to do as, as an institution? And I think mostly as librarians, because um, no kidding, it's, it's, it's for the most part is the information specialist that um, um, whose authority it comes under to manage the repository, but who are the motivators uh, of these uh, policies, basically, so to speak. Um, you must assess the international policies. You need to have a good knowledge of what is going on. What are other institutions with good policies doing? And what is your positioning within this context, right? So you need to have an understanding of that. What are similar organizations doing? What are good practices for policies? Uh, then in order to, to initiate, let's say, a, a policy, you need to initiate an internal institutional dialogue within your institution. So you would need to inform 
uh, the higher administration, but you would need to have supporters uh, and involve researchers from all departments. So for example, create an open access policy working group within the institution that will include you know, representatives from departments, somebody, a vice rector for academic affairs. So you need to steer the thing. And you also need some enlightened um, champions, uh, such as uh, researchers, who are very um, friendly to the idea and can help you actually, can help you towards pushing the policy with other faculty and can help you populate your repository. Um, you obviously need a repository, and if you don't have uh, your own, I think collaboration, collaboration, collaboration is the work here. Uh, there is a lot of know-how, you know, we are all, um, a lot of people are involved in, in Cyprus, in open air, in core, etc. You can get help um, to develop an, an, um, a repository, and I think also the libraries have a very good collaboration amongst themselves uh, in Cyprus, so I think uh, it looks very auspicious here. Um, you need to develop your policy, so you need to develop a policy uh, a content document, assigning also responsibilities, right? Uh, you know, for example, what will the library do? What does the university administration is responsible for? What should the researchers do? And we will see that in brief uh, below. You need a lot of guidance, training, and support for researchers. This is a, a relatively new thing. So um, uh, in the frame of continuous education, researchers also need to be trained and educated on this. So you need to have seminars, webinars, you need to go to department, you need to present to them very clearly and succinctly the benefits that they will have from the policy, the benefits for their institution and for themselves. Um, you need to pre uh, provide incentives and rewards to them, and this will uh, a lot of time comes in, in good repository services. For example, them being able to see, um, you know, what are the top papers, each one to be able to see their profile and the hits, the downloads, citations, things like that um, is what they like. Um, and an actual demonstration a long time that this works and is good for them in numbers. This is what, um, what is good. Um, then you need to have a, a, a compliance monitoring mechanism, and this is your repository. So if you, um, if you say that you know, my policy is mandatory to deposit in the repository, then you can compare the results from, say, indexers such as Scopus and, 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 the, and Thomson Reuters to what is deposited in your repository and see what are the deposit rates. Um, and then you need to have an institutional commitment. A repository is not something you build now and uh, a policy and you dump five years down the road. It, it is part of the long-term strategy for accessibility and preservation of an organization's output. So it's, it's, it's a rather serious thing. Uh, and in this, I guess you need to get connected and, and, and share resources and knowledge as much as possible. So. Uh, uh, I will show you this in very, uh, very quickly, that we, uh, Pasteur for Open Access, which is a project that I direct, has developed a, a series of um, advocacy materials and resources, actually, which are uh, destined for, um, for librarians, for open access advocates, as well as for policymakers, which are succinct. But this one, for example, describes, gives you practical information on developing your policy and, and actually expounds on all these things that I just mentioned. So I highly recommend it, and I will go through this um, again. Now, the project, again, also did um, big research on, on what policies are effective, and it's clear that they need to be mandatory. And again, I, I, I need to tell you, and linked to evaluation. So the only way to convince researchers to deposit is if you link it to evaluation. And as I said again here, uh, the interest is mostly being able to gather the entire uh, peer-reviewed output in the repository and less so on open access. Uh, what we also found is that open access will come if you're able to make the researchers deposit in the repository. This means that things may be closed for a little longer period of time than you want, but it might be worth it because the compliance rates are rather high. Um, oh, this is one of the Pasteur materials, and, Pasteur, and I will show you some of these things. Um, just to show you what uh, you can get from there, because I think um, just giving you this information on where the resources are, are uh, is important. We have resources for policy guidelines, which is guidelines uh, for institutions, which is exactly in, in, in very in detail what uh, I told you today. 
um, as well as for funders. We have a number of national case studies which showcase how various countries did their national policies. Um, institutional case studies which shows how a number of institutions with successful policies and repository did it. So they're really how-to manuals. I mean, if you wonder how am I going to do it, um, it's, it's a good place to go because we give you evidence on how other people did it and what was important and what they did good and what they did wrong. And uh, sometimes this information is actually hard to collect, which is, could be practical but hard to disseminate. It's all there. So um, funder case studies, for example, the Austrian Science Fund that has a very good policy, uh, how they did it and why it's good and it's working well is there. This was just published. And some thematic resources, such as briefings on article processing charges, etc. And so, yeah, I wanted to show you these two things, and then I, I think I will very, very briefly talk about roles, and then I'll be done. Am I running out of time? Okay. Um, so. If you go to the advocacy materials and you go to the policy guidelines for research performing organizations, um, this is basically the document that supersedes the Medonet guidelines, which is the blue little book that is going around. This time we decided not to print the book, but it seems that people like to have printed books. <laughs> so maybe that was wrong, but why oh, can't, I think I'm having a hard time with the mouse here, okay. So this will give you basically, if you are, if you are um, um, a librarian, I think we've given you a template to use and copy for, for your organization. This is the entire 15-pager that you can give to your rector. You just copy it. We also have it in Greek for Greek institutions, and we are happy to share. It's not here yet, but it's basically the same one that we are giving to our uh, people in Greece. So you explain to them the context, what is open access very briefly, the benefits of open access very briefly, the policy content at a glance, what is required to implement an open access policy. And this, this particular part is again expounded upon in this other thing that I, I told you about how to prepare for an open access policy, which is really for you. And then you have an open access, you have a practical checklist. Have you done this? Have you done that? Have you think about it? This is actually what people required us to do. And then you have a model open access policy. So the model has been prepared by Alma and myself and Eloy and the project partners to align with um, current best practices and Horizon 2020 requirements. And this is the project that we are promoting for institutions um, across Europe to assume. So, and we're hoping that you know most of, uh, you know, some at least institutions may um, may assume this. But this is exactly uh, what I said earlier. So here, for example, it determines number one: researchers deposit in an institutional repository digital copy, as well as the metadata of all publications. And it's, it explains which, which version, so either the author version or the publisher version, upon acceptance for publication. So at publication, more or less. Um, and res researchers are responsible, so it assigns the responsibility of the researchers. Um, it requires all the uh, text of publications to be openly available upon deposit or as soon as possible afterwards. This one is strong. It, it uh, fully aligns with... Uh, with um, Okay, thanks. Uh, with EU regulations for 12 months. But anyway, do, do check it out. I mean, it goes through the entire checklist that I, um, I told you earlier, and I do highly recommend that you um, um, sort of assume at least uh, um, all of the parameters, boo, that we recommend. Um, the other thing is, I'm, I'm not, uh, just to briefly mention, I, I said to you about open access policies for research data and that these are usually different documents. This comes as a result of a work that we did with the Recode project. Again, it has the same thing. It, has, it presents recommendations for policy makers. Um, it also has, if I'm not mistaken, it has policy models, which are modeled after the, usually the, the British uh, policies. Um, it's very good, this is a brief booklet, but it also, we have an interactive version. I highly recommend that institutions uh, and you as librarians 
it's a new version, it's interactive. So if you go to policy.recodeproject.eu, you will find that. Um, and it's a short version, but if you want to read an analysis, for example, if you're a funder and you want to read an analysis of current things going on among funders, we have a very long version online, which is a project deliverable. I highly recommend, again, that you see this. It's the result of extensive research. So, but talking about the who, so what are the responsibilities of, of the various parties involved in an institutional policy? The libraries, we said, they're usually the initiators of the policy and the repository, and they're the managers of the repository, right? They're the ones who um, manage the repository and are responsible for it often in collaboration with IT. They're responsible for training and for awareness raising, so they themselves need to be very well educated to do this. And they're also usually a, a required to assist with monitoring. So if your rector says, fine, we'll do this policy, then they will say to you immediately after, yes, right, but you need to give me the numbers because I need to know. So, so you, you need to know that you will be required to work also on monitoring. And actually monitoring policies is, is another um, research work that we will be producing from uh, Pasteur because there's a lot of interest in it on behalf of funders and institutions. The higher administration of the uh, research uh, um, institution will support it, will pass the policy, will review periodically the policy, and should, of course, commit some financial support and, of course, human resources. This should be an agreement with the library and uh, departments. Uh, researchers, I mean, it's, it's very good, as I said earlier, to involve them in the deliberations because they are the ones who will be um, depositing, and when you have a research policy, an open access policy, what we mean is that the focus is on current research and not on the library running behind researchers to get their stuff from 10 years and 20 years from now, which is their old stuff which they want to put online. You can do this if you want, but if you do this, you will be running behind the researchers and you will never have your current research um, managed in a repository. And um, of course, um, I, mean, I guess famously it's Bernard Ratier says that, you know, I feel like, a, what was he saying? I feel like I am a, a producer and I don't know how much I produce. I mean, institutions have no clue. It's very common exactly how much they produce. So the repository is one way to this end and you need to have the researchers on board to be gradually uh, depositing their materials online. But of course, again, this is a long process to get there. So, so this, these are basically the role. I think in, in Cyprus, I'm, I'm very auspicious from what I've seen that you will do great because you collaborate very well. And all you say is just take advantage, especially of EU-funded projects and initiatives that are here to help everyone and are very willingly uh, will help you. Open Air, um, Core, Pasteur for policies. Uh, these are uh, public resources for you to, um, to use in order to be able to make the best uh, for Cypriot policies and for open access and repositories. I think this is all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. I hope I didn't go much over time. <laughs>